Hi everyone. So welcome to our class. Today we'll talk about hashing and we'll see how to implement hashing uh, in various programming languages. So we'll learn what hashing is and what hashing is used for is basically for mapping keys, arbitrary keys to values and storing those values and key value pairs, in fact, into uh, tables. And the, re the real reason is because uh, in an array, we can access the elements in uh, a constant time. We'll learn how to obtain this hash code for an object and design the hash function to map a key to an index in that table. We'll learn how to uh, handle collisions using two different schemes, open addressing, and uh, various versions of open addressing. And then we'll learn separate chaining. We will learn how to set the load factor and uh, when do we need rehashing. And we'll learn how to implement a my hash map and a hash set using hashing. So let's start from the beginning. Basically, what's the point for hashing and why do we want it? So in the last four lecture, we learned about binary search trees. And then we learned about AVL trees, which will give us in the best uh, 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 case, uh, a worst time complexity of log of n. But really we know that we can access elements in an array uh, or in a map in constant time of one. So how is that done? Basically a map is, a, or a dictionary or a hash table or an associative array, these are all names for maps is a data structure that stores key value pairs. And this key is used to find that corresponding value. And we would basically want to find this key in constant time. So you can think of a map that is a large dictionary, like for instance, WordNet, that you can basically search based on the word for the definition of that word. Okay. so. A dictionary is basically an example of a, a, a map. And what we want is to obtain a constant time to access, to search, insert, or delete an element in the map. And here is an example of a hash map in Java. So basically we import the Java util hash map. We create a new hash map where the key is of the type string and the value is of the type integer. We are going to store key value pairs, the name of a person and its uh, integer age in this hash map. And we insert multiple elements, Smith with a, a value of 30, Anderson with a value of 31, Lewis for, with a value of 29, Cook with a value of 29, and Smith with a value of 65. So we can see that values can repeat, like for instance, Lewis and Cook have the same age, but the keys cannot repeat. We only have one entry for that key in the, in the hash map. And then we basically, I'm showing here the, how to use the hash map in Java. So map in a, in a print will basically use the to string method and return the set of uh, key value pairs that is in the hash map. You can get the age of Lewis by using map.get and then the key Lewis. You can check if a key is contained in the, in the hash map. Smith is yes, an element in the, uh, it's a key in the hash map. So it's basically prints true. You are looking if a value is contained in the hash map. So this is basically a way to look over all the values and find if there is 33 in the hash map, which is false. Then you remove Smith and the keys in the hash map do not contain Smith anymore. And if you clear the entire map, nothing is in the database anymore. So basically what a hash map is, it's a key value set. Now arrays, if you remember, uh, allow you to access an element, retrieve an element, uh, update an element and delete an element from the array if you replace it with uh, null or basically with a replacement. Uh, you can remove and uh, you can retrieve an element in O of n. 
So really what we can do for key value pairs is to store them in an array that will give us this constant access time. And we use the key as an index. Now, the problem is that the key is a string or, or could be any object in general. And even when we translate it with a, to an integer, we may actually have to scale it down to an index to the size of an array. And that's exactly what we are going to do. We are going to write, and that's what hashing is, is the process of mapping a key to an index and then retrieving the uh, element at that index from the array. Such an array that stores the values in a hash map is called a hash table. And the function that maps the key to an index in that hash table is called a hash function. And the overall process of retrieving the value for a certain key by transforming that key with a hash function to an index into the hash table and obtaining that uh, value without performing a search in constant time is the process of hashing. And this actually applies not only for retrieval, but also for inserting elements in the hash table or removing elements from the hash table. So first we start with hash functions. And if you remember, uh, basically we said that if the object class has a hash code method. All, all classes in Java has a, have a, a hash code method. And the typical hash function is one that takes the key and maps it to an integer value. And then because that integer value is too big, that integer value is called a hash code, but is too big as an index to our hash table, we compress that, that hash code into the actual index to the table. So we need actually two functions. And usually the second function is simple. It's just a mode. You can get the remainder after division with the size of the table. But the first function is actually the more interesting one. How do you map any kind of objects to an integer value? So Java, as I said, already has a hash code method, which returns the hash code integer value and for any basically object in memory. And the default for the class object in memory is uh, for the class object in Java is basically to return the uh, memory address in the virtual address uh, space for the uh, JVM, Java Virtual Machine. So, and actually that decimal that is returned as an integer is the equivalent to what the two string method prints in hexadecimal. So here I have an example, basically I created an object and I printed the hash code. If you transform this integer value into hexadecimal, you will see that is indeed the value that is printed when you print the, when you use the two string method from uh, the object class. So if, if this basically, the println basically takes the same with o dot to string. And if you are taking this number as an integer, and let's say that we are going to use the calculator. Uh, that integer is basically as a hexadecimal. You see that is 15DB9742. So it is indeed exactly what we were expecting. So the value that is printed, that is returned as the hash code is basically the address in hexadecimal of that object in memory. I'm going to start Eclipse in the background because we are going to do some experiments in Eclipse. Now, one thing that you should do when you implement a, a new class, you should override this hash code method to whatever basically implementation of hash code you may want. And I will explain a couple of implementations in the next slides, how to get the hash code for a long value, for a double, for a float value, for a string, uh, and so on. So only thing that you have to be careful about the hash code is that uh, you should ensure that two equal objects, two objects that the equal method says that is true, should return the same hash code. Basically, it means that the two objects are indeed uh, equal, equal with respect to the equals method. 
And this is what you, you can actually see that equals between two objects, compares the addresses, because that's actually what you are trying to compare, uh, uh, trying uh, to compare the hash codes for the two objects. Two unequal objects may have the same hash code and it's actually called a hash collision, but you should try to implement the hash code function to avoid too many such cases. So really the hash code uh, takes an object in a domain that may be infinite, like all the possible strings, and tries to map it to an integer set, what is storable, let's say, in, in, in an integer. So, of course, you will have collisions, but you will have to try to avoid as many such cases as possible, because you're trying to map a larger set on a smaller set. Now, during the execution of a program, if you invoke the hash code method multiple times on the same object, you should return the same integer, provided that the data in that object hasn't changed. So for instance, if you are returning the hash code for an array list, an empty array list, no matter how many times you call it, and even on a new array list, you will get the same value for the hash code. But the moment that you are adding a new object to this array list, the hash code may change. So, of course, the data, because now is not equal to the previous array list that didn't have uh, any element in it. So, as you can see, if you have arrays, array lists that are, contain the same elements, then the hash code is equal. But if you have different array lists, uh, or basically array lists that are modified, the new hash code is different. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions at any point. Now, what are the hash codes for any kind of like types uh, already existed in uh, existing in Java? So first of all, all the integers and characters are simply cast to int. So basically two different search keys of any one of these types will have the different hash codes because these are all types that fit perfectly in int or they are smaller than int. Uh, the search key for the type float, it will basically is just cast it into an integer. So you get the same represent bit representation as you have for the floating number. Uh, floats are represented on four bytes, same with int in Java. Therefore, if you take a float and you transform it to integer bits and you read that as an integer, you will see that basically it's exactly the same with the hash code for that float. So this is basically an example that shows that I took a float. I, for that specific float, I computed a hash code value and then I transformed into integer uh, a float 1.23 as a float and is basically the same representation as a float, as a, as a hash code. What about for long? One first direction for long is that you basically cast it to an int and, but that's not really a good choice because what basically happens is that all the numbers, so the, you have a bit representation for long if you keep only the first 32 bits or the basically the lower end 40, 32 bits, doesn't matter what the rest of the bits are, which are basically uh, half of the long values, they are basically mapped to the same key. So it's really, if you take any value greater than that value, you will see that it basically matches the same key. So it's not a very good hash, uh, a very good hash function. What you should do internally is to actually take the two halves and combine them. Then you will have a collision only with other numbers in the same, with, with basically the same uh, 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 binary operation that we have here. So what I basically did here, I did, a shift with 32 bits for that the key. I combine the two halves. The first half is basically the lower 32 bits with the other half that is the upper 32 bits. And after I combine that conjunction of the two, I basically obtained a, a new 
hash code, which is the same with the hash code that I can basically uh, get with the hash code method. So it's a way to have the least number of collisions for every value as, uh, as an integer. For double is a very similar process because doubles are represented on eight bytes. You first cast it to a long, you get the long value for that double or you, ob you obtain it based on the method double to long bits. And then you basically do the folding operation that we saw for, for uh, long. So basically that operation and then casting to int is exactly the same that we are needing in this case, it was because it basically fit within the space for uh, an int. But normally, I should use the folding operation that I had in the previous case. Okay. The, cast, the hash codes for strings are a little bit different. One intuitive approach is to sum the unicodes for all the character codes, and that will give you an integer. But this approach will give you uh, strings that have the same letters, but different order as the same hash code. So you have a lot of collisions. For instance, if you take the letters in Fodor and you construct the anagram Frodo, which was a character in Lord of the Rings, you would get that Fodor and Frodo are the same uh, based on the hash code. And you don't want that. You basically, a better approach is to actually compute a unique uh, integer for the string that you have and as much as possible unique. And the, such an approach is the following. Instead of, so it's kind of similar to what we had before. We took the unicodes, we sum them, but now we don't just sum the unicodes. We multiply each character with a base to a power of the position. So really you take the position of the numbers into consideration. If the base would be one, then it's the same with adding all the unicodes, but the base is usually not one. So you basically have this formula where you multiply every character like S of I with B to the power of I, where B is some positive integer. Now, this formula can actually be easily computed by iterating over the characters, and multiplying each character with B, adding the next character, multiplying the whole sum with B, adding the next character and so on. So this can be basically obtained in a linear space in the size of the uh, string and only multiplication and addition. You don't need power because that's more, much more uh, expensive. This expression is a polynomial in B and is called the polynomial hash code. Now, these hash codes will give you a big number because now you basically compute powers of numbers and products. So, but one thing that you may have noticed by now is that in Java, arithmetic overflow is ignored. If you compute something like this, a product of a lot of numbers, you know that this doesn't fit in an integer. It's impossible to fit in an integer, but actually uh, it does compute an integer value. And this is the same that we do for hash codes. So we are not actually computing this value. We are actually truncating that value as we are computing the function. It's basically only keeping the integer part of that specific function. Uh, in any case, you also have to choose an appropriate B to minimize the collisions and also to simplify that the product that we saw before. So, you, normally that value B should be uh, uh, large prime numbers, but really what we are looking for is for an approximation. So it takes, for instance, the hash code for strings in Java, takes the number 31 and uses it as the power B. And really the, the uh, one thing that I'm not telling you here is that 31 is actually 32 minus one so actually it doesn't do multiplication and we are seeing here when you multiply with 32, you are basically uh, shifting to the uh, right with four positions, the entire byte, the whole bytes. So instead of doing actually multiplication, it does shift right, uh, left with four bytes and then subtracts one, ver one uh, instance of the hash code. That's actually the same with multiplication with 31. 
Then the hash code for the key is a large integer. But even as an integer, uh, it does is not the uh, index in a table because a table is not doesn't have as many elements as you have as max int. So you need again to scale it down. So this is the hash code, which you need to scale it down to as an index to the hash table. And usually uh, the most common way to do it because the hash table has indices between zero and some n minus one, where n is the size of the hash table, is to compute the remainder after division of the hash code with n. And that gives you basically this value that is an index in the array. Now the problem is that indices have also to spread evenly, otherwise you will have a hash collision and we'll have to avoid collisions or find another spot for the element. And to ensure that the indices are spread evenly, you choose an n that is a prime number greater than two. However, as I said, it's time consuming to find large prime numbers. So in Java, the API for hash, uh, basically for hash map n is set uh, to a power of two. And the reason for that is the fact that basically what we have here is that hash code modulo n, you actually don't need to compute the remainder. What you can do is a bitwise conjunction with n minus one in binary. And that's because conjunction, disjunction, and other binary operations can be done in one unit uh, uh, clock. So basically it's much faster than modulo operation. And I give you an example here. For instance, if n is equal with four and you want to compute the remainder, the remainder of uh, a hash code like 11 with four is three. After division with four, you have eight as a multiple of four, 11 minus eight is three, which is between zero and four, not including four. The same operation in binary would be the, bi uh, the binary hash code, which is for 11, we have zero, one, zero, one, one. And n minus one is three, which is in binary zero, 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 one, one. And then it does binary conjunction or bitwise conjunction between the hash code and n minus one. In this case, it will obtain three because basically zero and zero is zero, one and zero is zero, zero and zero is zero, and then one and one in both cases is one. And again, the reason is that division or multiplication remainder are much slower than bitwise conjunction. So we'll strive to actually have the size of the uh, table as a power of two. Now also in order to ensure that hashing is evenly distributed, another supplemental function is used in addition to the primary hash function in the implementation of hash map. So if you get a value H uh, as the current hash index, you again apply a more complicated function. So basically in this case, you get a disjunctive or between the current H and then you basically shift to the right H with 20 positions. You compute another disjunctive or with H shifted to the right with 12 positions, shift and rotate. And then you actually return a disjunctive or between the current H and H shifted to the right with seven positions and then with four positions. So really the hash code that you are getting as the index in the table is this supplemental ha hash of the hash code, modulo n, which internally is actually uh, computed as that supplemental hash code of the hash code con a bitwise conjunction with n minus one, where n is a power of two. So in summary, a typical hash function converts a search key to an integer value, which is the hash code. And then this key is compressed through modulo operation uh, or basically that bitwise conjunction to an index of the hash table. Let's see what questions we have in the chat. Does the bitwise conjunction return the common digits in two binary strings? Uh, Adit, what do you mean by that? Uh, 
the common digits in a two bi in two binary strings. Uh, yes, it's a bitwise conjunction. So one and zero is zero, zero and uh, zero is zero, one and one is one, and one and one is one. So it's basically pairwise conjunction between the corresponding elements. And of course, one and one is one, and everything else, if one of them is zero, or both of them are zero, the corresponding bit in the output is zero. So you are right with that example. Okay, so now the question is, what do we do with collisions? So a collision may still occur because you are mapping a larger domain to a smaller domain. So it's the pigeonhole property that uh, principle that you take uh, double number, the number of pigeons as you have holes. This basically ensures that there is at least one hole that has uh, more than uh, one pigeon. And basically this is the same problem that you have a bunch of keys and the set of keys is much larger than the indexes in the table, you have a collision. And there are two different ways to handle collisions. One is called open addressing and the other one is separate uh, 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 chaining. So open addressing is the process of finding an open location in the hash table. So if you, or to find the element in the hash table in the event of a collision. And there are various variations of how to implement uh, open addressing, linear probing, quadratic probing, uh, double hashing. And separate chaining means that basically the elements in the hash table are references and they are references to an array list of the actual values or a linked list. In most cases is a linked list with the actual key value pairs. So the, there is a separate chain for every single uh, index where you have the actual uh, 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 pairs, key value pairs. Now, this actually tells us that if we have a lot of values uh, and a lot of collisions, we are not paying a constant price to search the element. And the reason for that is that we basically pay the price of uh, iterating over that linked list to find the element, the separate chain. I'm going to implement hash tables this way and then basically through open addressing. But let's start with open addressing. So the first version of open addressing is called linear, uh, linear probing. So uh, basically you have a collision that basically means that the function that you computed uh, scale down to the indices in the table, uh, you compute the same index for two different keys. And so when you want to insert a new element, linear probing, if the current position is taken, will actually look for the next available position. So as I said, when you have a collision is when uh, K modulo N gives you the same value for two different keys. If the hash table for K modulo N is already taken, so for instance, we have 26 as the key. 26 modulo 11 is four. And that actually four already contains the key that is four. So in that case, we'll basically look for the next position. And if that is taken, we are going to look for the next position and continue until we find an empty position. Now you will notice that some of these keys are just mixed. Like for instance, 16 is in its right position because 16 modulo five is uh, uh, basically five, modulo 11 is five. And this 16 is in the right position, but because we are using linear probing, we have to continue to search for another empty position for uh, 26. So 26 will be inserted at seven. In fact, when we are going to look for 26, we use the same hashing algorithm uh, uh, function. So 26 will be matched to 26 modulo 11, which is four. Since it's not found there, we have to continue. And we have to continue either until we find that element or we find an empty position telling us that we, if we used a uh, linear probing, we would have found it. Otherwise it's not there. It was never inserted. So in this case, we are using a very simple uh, hash 
function. We just take the key and we consider it as an identity hash function. Then we uh, do the modulo with the size of the array, which is 11, to find the position in that array. Okay. And we do linear probing to find if there are collisions, uh, other elements stored in the array with a different key. Now, to remove an entry from the hash table, we do the same algorithm for searching. We basically uh, start from the position given by the index after modulo and iterate over the following, uh, following elements if we haven't found the uh, entry for that specific key. Even if the entry is found, instead of deleting it, because that there were probably other keys instead of basically, let's say that this was a key that we deleted, but maybe other keys are now relative to previous keys, like 26 will be inserted here. We have to mark the position for 28 as occupied. It was previously used, is not in use anymore, but if we are looking for 26, we should continue looking in the rest of the table. We shouldn't stop at the first empty position. So that's basically what this says, that in addition to the key value pair, that cell also has a state property. And this state property, it's either says it's occupied, and that's actually the key value pair that is inset, in, inside, is marked, which basically means that it was a key value pair at some point that it was deleted, but I'm not going to delete it from the uh, hash table because uh, for follow-up future uh, hash values, I might have it there. Uh, and that mark cell could be also used for insertion because insertion is done uh, sequentially. So basically I can use it if a new element, let's say a new 26 or uh, 28 is inserted in the hash table. Now, linear probing has disadvantages. And the main disadvantage is the fact that it may actually have these kind of positions where all the values are occupied, but many other spaces are empty. Because basically linear probing only says that if there are collisions, just use the next position available. So a set of consecutive cells that are basically all occupied is called a cluster. And actually the uh, search time to find an element in the hash table is not unit time, is not constant, is actually the size of the largest cluster. That's the worst time complexity. So really what we try also, what we should try to avoid in, in hashing is to also avoid large clusters. So really what a cluster is, is a uh, probe sequence that you must search, search it in entirely to retrieve an element or add or remove or declare that the element is not in the hash table, that key is not in the hash table. Moreover, if these clusters grow, like for 75% load factor in the hash table, uh, you may actually, this, uh, clusters may actually grow into larger clusters because they basically merge into a larger cluster. And that slows even more the search time because now you'll have to search double the distance uh, uh, basically of the previous cluster. And this is a big disadvantage. That's why linear probing is actually not used in uh, industry. Quadratic probing is a better idea instead of looking at consecutive cells, it uses powers of indices, sum with the hash code to actually look for the follow-up cells. So it's instead of looking for uh, K modulo N, K modulo N plus one and so on, or K, mod K, K plus one modulo N, K plus two modulo N and so on. So iter iterating over uh, consecutive indices, what it can do is to do a skip. So in this case, we look at the current element, then we look at the next element, then we skip at the element, uh, the hash code plus four, then hash code plus nine, hash code plus uh, 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 16 and so on. So it's a quadratic function. It computes the power, uh, the square of the index of basically this uh, additional uh, padding to the index. 
So for instance, the same previous example that you saw before, after we are looking at the index for uh, 26, which has the remainder of four, it adds to that one, and then it looks at index five. Then to four, it adds four, which looks at, looks at index eight and so on. So really what we are basically do, looking in this example is that we are actually skipping one step or then three steps, then five steps, basically is looking for, or four steps, is looking for those, uh, that quadratic function indices. So if you're looking for another element, let's say an element that is 16, it will look next in the next position 28, and then it will jump to nine, the position nine. So it avoids some of the collisions. It doesn't go sequentially one by one, it skips in any case. So quadratic probing is kind of similar to linear probing, except the search sequence skips multiple steps instead of one step at a time and going and creating clusters. So it really avoids one, the linear clustering, the first problem that we saw. It has a secondary clustering problem if the, the two entries actually collide, if the keys collide, then you have the same probe sequence. So no matter if you have two keys that are mapped to the same index, you have the same skips. You skip one, then you skip three, then you skip four and so on. So it's really a problem with uh, quadratic probing is that it avoids some clustering issues in linear probing, sequential elements, but it has its own clustering problem for collisions because then you have the same probing sequence. Now, it has a second disadvantage. Linear probing guarantees that if you have an empty cell in your table, because we are going it, uh, from the beginning step by step to the next elements until we find an empty position and we do rotation, basically the moment that you get to the end, you start from the beginning at index zero. This guarantees that even if you have a single empty cell you can find it in the lin in linear probing. But for quadratic probing, you basically have the same skip. So after you skip one, then three, then four, then eight, then uh, 16, you may actually reach through rotation a position that you actually skipped, uh, you already were on before. And you can skip in the same cycle, which maybe has all of the positions uh, uh, occupied, but a position that is empty is never going to be reached because the function basically skips always over that position that is empty. Now, another idea for open uh, addressing is double hashing. So one problem that we saw with uh, quadratic hashing is that you are basically not using the hash code anywhere. You are using basically just one, four, nine, 16 for the skip positions. So double hashing basically uses both linear and uh, quadratic probing adds an increment, one or K or J square for quadratic probing. And these are independent of the keys. What double hashing does computes a second function, which could be basically as uh, 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 similar to what we did for simple hash functions. Basically you compute a hash and then you modify the, you subtract some value out of it. And that gives you the skip step. So, or gives you the base. So really what the second function, it determines different increment skips and avoids clustering. So instead of jumping J steps, and or j multiply with some value constant steps, you multiply it with a value that is dependent on the hash key, on the key value. So j plus k plus j multiply with h prime of the key, the second hash function. And basically I can show you an example. So let's assume that I have a hash table and I basically have a secondary hash uh, uh, function which is for basically getting the index. Now in linear hashing, if a position like for 12 is taken, it will try the next position, next position and so on. 
So that basically gives us the initial position for the hash for the index in the hash table. But now h prime, it's a different function. I gave seven minus the key modulo seven. So h prime gives me the skip step. So for instance, for 12, it will be two. So it skips from 45 to three, then from three to five, and it inserts that value. For another key, the skip may be different. So instead of skipping two elements at one time, you skip three elements. And you start from the initial, the same initial position, like for instance, one, but you skip to four and then you skip to uh, eight and so on. So the advantage is that you really basically have another, the index that is added to the hash code is variable based on the key that you have. Separate chaining. So I told you that there are two different collision avoidance schemes. One is open uh, addressing, which were all of the different types of hashing that I talked about before, basically linear probing, quadratic probing, double hashing. And the second one is separate chaining uh, schemes, which basically means that that hash code is only used to find the appropriate element in the hash table, but that element is a reference to a linked list. So now you basically have a bucket. Uh, this is called the separate chain of elements that correspond to that, key, to that index in the table is called the bucket. And really what it can hold is multiple entries, key value pairs. Okay. So for instance, when I want to insert 26, 26 modulo 11 is four. Four is already there, but I will actually have a, next link to 26 and next link is null. So basically it's a way to keep all of the elements for that specific key in, the, in that one element in the table. Now, one thing that we talked about earlier this semester when we talked about hash map in the Java collection framework is the load factor. So lambda, the load factor is the ratio between the elements uh, that were added to the hash versus the size of the hash table. So it's lowercase n, which is the number of elements in the hash, fun in the hash table divided by the size, the number of locations in the, in the hash table. Zero would basically mean that the hash table is totally empty. One would mean that basically the number of elements in the hash table is the same with the number of locations in the hash table. So really the lambda is a value between zero and one for uh, open addressing schemes. For the separate chaining, lambda can be anything because you really can have a li linked list from any key and that linked list can be of any size. So it can be greater than one. As lambda increases, you also get a, prob a higher probability of col uh, collisions. So because like for instance, when lambda is, let's say 0 0.1, you have a lower chance that you reach those 10 different elements, 10% of elements that contain the, uh, a key with a similar hash func value. Now 0 0.5 means that only half of the elements in the uh, array are occupied. 0 0.9, you should basically duplicate the array or create a different hash map that for basically the elements and then rehash the all the elements into this new hash map. In the Java API, uh, the threshold for the load factor is set to 0 0.75. If the load factor increase, uh, if the load factor is exceeded, that basically means that now we have more elements than the load factor. What we usually do, we increase the size of the hash table and then we reload or rehash the entries in uh, the larger table. And that's because the size of the table has dif it's different. So the hash code function is modulo different size. Okay. Now we need to change the hash function since the hash function uh, table uh, has been changed. So basically that's why we need rehashing to put all of the elements into the new hash table. One thing that you should be aware of is that 
the uh, that basically you should avoid rehashing. So when you actually have a, a too small table, normally what you should do is to duplicate the size of the hash table. So you avoid this operation of rehashing, uh, at least for as many elements as they are currently in the uh, hash table. And here I have an implementation of uh, hash sets and hash maps, hash maps first. So I start first with what would be the interface and this is the interface that is uh, in the map uh, uh, interface in the Java API, in the Java collection framework. So a map is a generic type with the key and the value types K and B. Then we have methods for checking if, uh, to, for clearing the hash uh, uh, map or the hash table. Then we have contains that you pass a key and it returns true or false, true if the key is in an entry in the hash table and false otherwise. Contains value returns true if of that value that is passed as a parameter is mapped to any one of the keys that we have in the hash table. Entry set returns the set of all of the entries in this hash table. Get given a key, it returns the value corresponding to that key. Is empty returns true if the hash table is empty and the hash map is empty and false otherwise. Key set returns the set of all the possible keys. So basically it's a simple way to find a key without having to uh, do an operation on the hash table or hash map. Uh, remove key basically removes a key from the hash map and the corresponding value. Size basically returns the integer, the number of elements mappings in the hash map. And values returns the set of all the values in the hash map. My hash map is a concrete uh, class that implements the my, my map interface. One other thing that I wanted to tell you is that entries are actually a separate inner class to my map. So basically a map entry is a key value pair. So here is the implementation. So first we created the interface with all of the methods that we saw before. Is a generic interface. It's parameterized on the type of the key and the type of the value. But you can basically see that it uses uh, standard prog Java programming techniques to basically return uh, out of the key a value of the specified type of that uh, hash map keys and so on for other uh, uh, methods like the key set returns a key uh, sets of keys in uh, the set of the type K and so on. So now we have other methods. So the, the values, basically it's all of these methods are abstract. They will be implemented in uh, subclasses of this interface. We have an inner class for entry or hash map entry, which basically keeps the key and the value pair. And we have other methods like the two string method and uh, get key and get value. Now we have the implementation of hash map. So a hash map implements the my map interface and then it starts defining first constants. The default initial capacity is a power of two. We have the maximum capacity, which is basically uh, one followed by 30 zeros is the largest integer represented as an int, int in Java. We have the load factor of 75%. We'll show you how to use it later. And we have uh, a linked list of uh, entries, key value pairs. Then we have the constructors. So we have a constructor that creates a hash map with original uh, initial capacity and a my map a hash map constructor that creates a concrete instance of a hash map. So if the initial capacity is greater than the maximum capacity, we set the capacity to maximum capacity. Otherwise we call this method trim to power of two, which what it basically finds is the smallest integer whose power of two is greater than 
the capacity that we passed as a parameter, okay? Trim to the power of two takes the initial capacity and we basically find the smallest integer that basically is still greater than the current capacity. And you see that basically here I'm doing products. I'm starting from one and then I start shifting with one position to the left, which is similar equivalent to multiplication with two. So the get method basically gets a key and what we want to do is to iterate over the bucket and the way that I implemented my hash map is actually to, with separate chaining. So really the bucket index is just the reference that is stored in the hash table at the value of the hash code. And then if the bucket uh, is currently null, then I create a new table with the size of the bucket uh, at that location of the bucket index. And then I iterate over the entries in the original bucket. And if that entry is not equal with one of the keys, uh, with the key, uh, the keys in the current table are, are, doesn't contain, uh, is not basically equal with the key that I'm looking for, it, it uh, uh, basically uh, returns that key if it's equal. So that's basically the implementation of get. It returns a key value, the value pair, uh, of for corresponding to that key. Then we have the is empty method, which just check that uh, the, the hash table is empty. And we have the key set table. So the key set method. The key set method defines a key a set as an hash set, which we actually we are going to implement later using the hash map. And then in a for loop iterates over all of the positions from zero to capacity. And the ta if the table is different than null, it takes the bucket from the table. Then it iterates with another for each loop over the different entries in that bucket. The entry basically has the key and the value as domains. And if we found it, we add in the set of results that specific uh, 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 key with the method get key. And then we return the set basically as the set of all the keys in uh, the table of keys. Okay. Now, next method that I want to talk about is contains value. So contains value takes a value of the va value V. It iterates over all of the uh, entries in the array. So basically, from zero to the capacity minus one. If the table is not null, it goes even down more. So it creates a linked list bucket that contains table of i. And then for every entry in that bucket, if the entry get value is equal with the value uh, for uh, this element that we are looking for compare for containing, it returns true that yes, I found the element. If uh, not, it basically goes to the next element. So it ex executes this up to the end before it returns true, or it returns false if none of the elements was equal with the element in the bucket. Entry set basically does the same thing, iterates over all of the elements in the hash set and adds them one by one to the set, to the uh, uh, basically result. Next, we basically have the size function, which returns the size of the hash map. And we have the put method. So what the put method does, it compares if the uh, element at that specific key is not null. If it's null, we have to do collision avoidance. But if it's not null, then you, we, we, what we basically do, we set the bucket index to the hash code of in that uh, hash set then a linked list uh, of entries is created bucket as a variable for linked list and is assigned the element in the table at index bucket index. For all of the entries in the bucket, if the old value, if uh, the old value of that uh, entry is set to the get value of that entry. So we basically replace the old value with the new value. 
uh, with put. And finally, we return the our old value. So after we replace it, we return the old value. The load factor is also checked because if the load factor, if the size is greater than the capacity multiplied with the load factor, uh, we check first if the uh, capacity is equal with the maximum capacity, like for instance, Java does, has limits for integers. Uh, if that is the truth, it calls rehash. So what rehash does, it creates another table of the same, uh, of double the number of elements. And then for every element in the first table, it calls the hash function to find its right place in the second table. So it basically uses uh, uh, this separate chain that I described here, okay? And finally, I'm adding the new entry in the current bucket for this specific index, bucket index, which is basically the power of two, similar to the uh, size of the matrix, okay? Then we add a new entry key value to the hash table at the uh, given bucket index. And this is basically done. This is a linked list and we are adding a new element in that linked list. We increase the number of elements in our hash table and we return the value that we just put. Rehashing, it's as I said, a similar operation. First, I'm creating a new and uh, uh, set of entries, then the, it doubles the capacity. So the capacity is shifted right, uh, left with one position and it creates a new linked list for that capacity. Then in a for loop, it iterates over the old set, basically the set of entries from the entry set, which is basically the set of all the entries in the original hash set. And for each one of them, it calls the put method for that entry. Uh, a key and value pair. Next, the two string method just creates a list of all of the elements in that array. So basically it iterates from the beginning to the end of capacity. If the element is not null or, and the size is greater than zero, it basically uh, iterates with a for loop over the entries in that list and at the end, it appends the additional entry. Okay. And basically I'm putting everything. So I'm basically building a string builder because I don't want to, uh, uh, basically I want to create a string incrementally with all of the values in my hash set. Removing, as I said, is quite interesting because you have to mark in, in the case of uh, open uh, addressing. In the case of a uh, uh, separate uh, uh, chain, basically first thing you have to do is to find the entry for the index. So you get a hash code for that specific key. Then you find if that uh, element in the table is not null. If it's null, you create a new linked list for that element and you basically put all of the elements, uh, put a new element in that uh, uh, linked list. You iterate with a for loop all over, uh, over the original uh, entries in the bucket. And if the key is equal with the key that you get, uh, that you basically get with get key, you remove that entry and you decrement the size of the hash map and you break. Basically you found it and you can return now. Values does something similar. It iterates over all of the elements of the array. If the element of the array is different than null, it gets the bucket from the element at index i. Then it iterates over all of the entries in the bucket and for every entry is calling set.add the value. So basically we populate a set with all of the values in our uh, uh, hash map. The rest of the methods are basically straightforward. We have the supplemental method for hashing just to basically avoid as many collisions as you can. We have the hash method, which basically computes the supplemental hash of the uh, current hash code and the capacity minus one. So basically does the 
uh, remainder, but with bitwise conjunction. Uh, removing the entries iterates over all of the uh, tables in uh, all of the indices in the uh, uh, hash table. And if the, if the element is different than null, it calls clear on that linked list that is the separate chain. The clear method sets the size of the uh, li linked list to zero, basically like there are no elements, and it involves the, me it in invokes the method remove entries, which basically clears every single entry in the uh, table, in the hash table. Contains key, gets the uh, element, the value of that key, and compares with null. If it's not null, then it's basically true that that key is contained. So here we have an example. For the same example that, uh, the same uh, example that I had earlier with Java collection framework uh, hash set, uh, I basically creating a hash map, I created my own hash map. And I inserted the same elements and removed them and basically all of the methods that we saw before are satisfied. We would also like to implement a hash set. So we implement a map, but we can also implement a set using the same technology. So what we are basically doing, we are going to implement a interface, my set, which implements the standard methods for a set, contains, add, remove, is empty, and size, and then a concrete class, a class my hash set. So the interface is straightforward, is an example of generic programming. E is the type that we parameterize this uh, set on. Then we have the public class MyHashSet, which basically implements the implementation of a set. So we have again the default initial capacity. We don't have a key anymore, so we are using the actual element to insert it in the hash set. Uh, so we use a linked list internally to implement the hash set. And then we have methods for creating a new hash set with a specified capacity. So again, we are going to use powers of two for the capacity. So this stream to power of two iterates with basically a while statement uh, until we basically double that is uh, bigger than the size that we passed as a parameter. Contains does exactly the same thing. So this is a hash set that is also implemented with separate hashing. So I get the index from the hash code of uh, the element. If that index is different than null, then I basically get a linked list corresponding to that uh, uh, element E by using the hash code, hash bucket in, uh, index. And then we iterate with the for each loop over all the elements in the bucket, and if the element is equal with element E, we return true. Otherwise, if we haven't found it, we return false. Is empty and the uh, size are straightforward. Is empty returns true if the size is zero. The size just returns the, the, the size. Adding, if the hash set contains the element E, then we basically returns false because it's not uh, needed to add it anymore. If the size plus one is greater than the capacity multiplied with the load factor, so the load factor is, let's say, 75%, uh, then we basically throw a runtime exception and we call the method rehash. And really what the method rehash does, I will show it to you in a couple of slides, is that basically it, uh, doubles the hash uh, table and it rehashes all the elements into the hash table. Next, we basically have to insert a new element. If the index bucket in the, the index in the bucket is null, we create a new linked list. And then for the current linked list, I add the element E, increment the number of elements in the uh, hash set and return true. Removing is done separately. Basically, what we need to do is to mark it for removal. So we again get the index from the hash code of the element. We get the linked list uh, from that element. And then in a for loop, we iterate over all the elements 
in the linked list. And if the elements are equal with E, we remove it, we remove that element from the bucket. Okay. And we need an iterator because all of these have iterators. And usually what we are going to do is to create a array list like we did last class for AVL trees, populate this array list from uh, basically the uh, hash set in this case. So we populate the array list from the hash set and then we implement the standard methods for has next and next. So has next, so we start with a cursor that is zero. That's the first element in the hash set. Has next checks if the cursor, the current cursor is less than the size of the uh, uh, basically uh, hash set. And then if it's true, if it, we return true, otherwise we return false. Next just returns the next element. So from that linked list with get current plus plus, we'll basically return the next element in the linked list. Uh, remove removes the element by just removing the element from the link uh, from the linked list. So it's just removing from the uh, set means removing from the linked list. Uh, computing the hash is identical with the previous function. We have the supplemental hash. We do modulo capacity, which is the same with uh, uh, conjunction bitwise conjunction with capacity minus one. We ensure that the hashing is distributed evenly by providing a supplemental hash function and then trimming to the power of two, make sure that it starts with one, shifts it left to the, uh, with a position and continues this until the, element, the new integer can be fit into the database or basically we pass the load factor. Removing elements iterates over all the elements and clears every single uh, bucket from every element. Rehashing iterates over the array list, uh, which is basically the set of all the keys in the hash table and the entries in the hash table. And then we basically uh, create a new linked list with the default capacity and linked it from the current element. So we add this. Uh, element to every one of the current go to the hash table. Set to list basically just does this transformation into an array list, but without having to remove the elements. And finally, we have the two string method, which just creates a string builder. And the advantage of using a string builder is that every time you modify the string, you create a new object. But for a string builder, you just append it to the current object. So it's much faster than uh, uh, other methods. And finally, I have a set. I basically, I, a test. I create a set in which I add all of the elements and then I test the methods for contains the main element and then iterator with uh, uh, the iterator that I had before. So any questions about hashing, mainly about the characteristics, how an hash value is computed, because that's basically the interesting part, how a hash value is computed, and then how do you avoid collisions in the, the two different collision avoidance schemes, open addressing, which is really a category of linear, quadratic, double hashing, and then separate chaining. The implementations that you find in the lecture notes are for separate chaining, but uh, it's actually quite easy to implement the three different algorithms that we had for uh, open addressing, linear, quadratic, and double hashing. Any questions? Okay. If there are no questions, I will stop the recording.